Okay, uh, Chuck Higgins, uh, Dr. Chuck Higgins grew up in Huntsville, Alabama, and the rumblings of the Apollo engine uh, test firings at the nearby NASA Marshall Space Flight Center captured his interest in astronomy and space. He completed a BS in physics from the University of Alabama, Huntsville, and received MS and PhD degrees from the University of Florida, where he studied the radio emissions from the planet Jupiter. His, uh, he was a National Research Council postdoctoral fellow at NASA's Goddard Space Flight Center and is now a professor of physics and astronomy at Middle Tennessee State University. Uh, and so he's gonna go over the Radio Jove 2 project. Okay. Chuck, go ahead. Well, thank you very much. Thank, thank you all for having me. I apologize for the uh, little bit of extra light in the background here. My window behind me, <laughs> I can't quite remove. I'll see if I can turn it here and reduce that. I've, I've got shades on it. Well, that, that's a little better. All right, I'll, I'll have to lean in here. <clears throat> Well, it's good to be here. Uh, again, thanks for having me. Let me uh, share screen here and bring up my um, PowerPoint. I'm going to try to flip back and forth between this and maybe show you some live data if I can, if I can do it. And let's see. There we go. Um, again, I'm Chuck Higgins. <clears throat> I've been uh, part of Radio Joe for uh, since the inception. We, we started it in the late 90s and sold our first kit, I think, in 99 with a, a few, uh, a few <clears throat> beta test kits before that. But we are uh, now uh, this year kicked off Radio Jove 2.0. So that's really what I wanted to uh, uh, highlight uh, to you and update update you on you know what we've been up to. So we've we've got a, a, a fairly good sized team here. I've listed everybody who's what we call our you know our core team. <clears throat> and you see several of those folks. You you probably know some of these names and some of these are Sarah members and uh, and you know, we call them citizen scientists. Um, <clears throat> and as you know, you know, Radio Jove, our, our history was uh, initially, you know, education and outreach, and it still is to, to, to a certain degree. And, uh, <clears throat> but now we're, we're, you know, with the advent of this new technology and, and uh, these new radios, new tools, we're, We've shifted uh, towards citizen science, so we, we want to emphasize um, doing some science uh, along with our education and outreach. So uh, <clears throat> our goal, of course, is to, as is yours in part and Sarah's in part, is to um, get people interested in radio astronomy and help them learn, and and and, and for us now to actually do some science and. And so uh, we have a lot of overlap there, it's, uh, which, which is great. And Sarah has been a, an excellent partner for Radio Jove throughout our, uh, throughout our history. <clears throat> but I'm at Middle Tennessee State University, uh, MTSU, and that is in Murfreesboro, Tennessee. That's the, the geographic center of the state of Tennessee, just to give you an idea of where we are. Um, and just like uh, many of you, we we have a radio, <laughs> not a radio quiet site here on campus. So I have uh, uh, a couple of telescope antennas set up out at our dairy farm, which is about nine, nine miles from campus. Um, one person I wanted to highlight before I go on is Samantha Blair. She's a new, uh, whoops, new person, um, and she's at Dalton State College in North Georgia, and she has um, some, uh, she's a radio astronomer, has some experience with the ALMA telescope, and uh, so she's, she's joined us um, here recently and, and uh, has gotten some students involved at, uh, at Dalton State College. So 
that's that's been been good for us. Now, I won't I won't uh, belabor this kind of stuff. <laughs> you you guys heard some uh, you know most of this already, and you, you heard some great um, uh, overviews from Ed and, and and Wolfgang yesterday. They were they were they were very very good. But uh, I just love to sh to show people to, to tell people you know why do we do we want to do radio astronomy and you know just what can we learn about the universe uh, using radio telescopes? And I, I, I love this M81 galaxy group comparison with optical and the 21 centimeter line picture because you just sh shows you a, a completely different world. And uh, uh, and, and you know all these uh, major discoveries in in, uh, uh, in astronomy due to uh, radio telescopes. So. Uh, and of course, the the latest fantastic pictures of these uh, supermassive black holes have uh, really uh, blowing blowing me away, and, and and a lot of other people away. So that's that's been been a, a lot of fun to uh, talk about uh, in the classes that I teach, and you know, in interactions I have with uh, with people and Radio Jove. Uh, so it's it's a lot of fun. I should say, uh, by the way. Uh, uh, I'm pretty informal, so please call me Chuck and uh, uh, raise your hand or, or uh, open your mic. And if you have a question, uh, feel free to, to stop me. I don't, I'm not going to take um, 45 minutes, I don't think, and certainly not going to take an hour and 15 minutes to, to, to end on, the, on a normal time here. But uh, uh, please, please uh, uh, feel free to ask a question anytime. Um, so you've heard you've heard some uh, radio bursts yesterday. Um, I'll play play this one real quick here. This is a, a nice solar burst that we got from Tom Ashcraft out of New Mexico. And I know some of you uh, know Tom. He is um, quite an excellent observer for, for Radio Jove. He does a lot of photography. He does Sprite. He's he's a, a I guess worldwide known Sprite observer. So the above cloud. Um, lightning discharges, um, and uh, uh, he's had a, a really nice write-up as a NASA citizen scientist um, and uh, an, ar uh, an artist uh, as well. So he's uh, he's one of our best observers. So this is a recent solar uh, burst with our uh, uh, some of our radio drive equipment here. I'll just play this real quick. a little more muffled than I than I uh, expected there so I apologize for that um, <clears throat> I'm probably having some crossovers between uh, my mic and and uh, some of these sounds here but this is a spectrograph so uh, frequency time um, plot of uh, and you see here type 3 and it looks like maybe a little bit of type 2 followed the, these, these type three solar bursts. And uh, on the right is the um, single frequency radio Jove, uh, 20 megahertz plot from, from of the same solar burst um, from Dave Topinski down in, in Florida. The audio uh, was taken at 20 megahertz, by the way. The audio you probably didn't hear very well, but... Uh, <clears throat> So that's a, a lot of fun to uh, let people hear, you know, audibleize some of these radio signals so they can hear the sounds of uh, some of these, oh, sorry about that, some of these uh, signals. And you heard this from, from Ed yesterday on the, the Jovian burst. Uh, I'll just play this real quick. Let's see if this one does any better. Following is Jovian S burst activity.
again, I, I know uh, most of you've heard heard that before, but uh, um, and as Rich mentioned, that's that's what I do is I study uh, mainly study Jupiter and its radio emissions, and you can see the cartoon there on the right showing you where the uh, um, <clears throat> locations um, of the emission regions at these uh, at the decametric frequencies, the, the DAM um, uh, emissions. So these are uh, similar to auroral um, radio emissions. So this is um, spiraling electrons in magnetic fields. And those electrons either come from uh, the solar sources or as, uh, as many of you know, the IO related um, emission that, uh, comes from the plasma generated by uh, uh, essentially the gravitation uh, melting the internals of uh, the interns of Io, which then causes volcanic activity, spews neutrals into the magnetosphere, which then get ionized by the solar UV. And now you have this giant plasma uh, torus and those field lines that uh, magnetic field lines from Jupiter that run through that torus then will, uh, you know, creates an electrical um, uh, connection between the two. And so you get um, extra electrons sort of moving along those field lines and, and those, uh, those generate uh, radio waves given the, the right uh, conditions lo local to the planet. And, uh, you know, of course, that same, same near the sun or near a, pol uh, a neutron star or, 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 or uh, wherever. So the, the, the physics is, uh, is, is very, very similar. So uh, as you know, astronomy, radio astronomy, no different. Um, optical astronomy, radio, no, no different. You know, we're remote sensing. We're trying to learn something about the local conditions of the emitting uh, objects or the emitting, emitting regions. So uh, uh, it's uh, you know, quite remarkable that we can, we can do that, knowing, knowing a little bit uh, of physics. And uh, ag again, I won't uh, talk about this too much because uh, Ed uh, went over this and, uh, and, and uh, uh, Wolfgang uh, t did as well, but uh, you've got many, many different sources of um, radio emission. Uh, I again focus on solar system objects, uh, the Jupiter and, uh, and, and now some um, solar radio emissions. And uh, the, the two main mechanisms of emission, of course, you have thermal emission, which um, for, uh, for us, for uh, us doing low frequency radio astronomy, the thermal is, is essentially non-existent. You, um, what we're hearing is the, the non-thermal component, the um, um, emission caused by um, moving charged particles in magnetic fields. So cyclotron or synchrotron um, or a maser type mechanism that will uh, focus or uh, direct those uh, radio waves from um, you know, distant sources that wouldn't, would be uh, otherwise would not be um, uh, detectable with such simple equipment as the radio Jove equipment. But uh, in the case of Jupiter, you know, with even with a single dipole, you can pick up uh, these these uh, radio emissions. So it's a great uh, a uh, a great <clears throat> uh, object to. Uh, to try to, to detect for a beginner, and even for, for some of us advanced um, folks, it's, uh, it's a lot of fun to uh, actually pick up the, the, the radio emissions from Jupiter and, uh, and or solar emissions. So um, I'll just show our website here. This is uh, recently updated in the, you know, the last six months. So we've sort of transitioned over to uh, our Radio Jove 2 um, equipment, our, our spectrograph equipment. So uh, we still have some, um, 
some improvements to, to, to work on, uh, particularly the data archive isn't fully opened back up yet. We, we've had some problems there, but uh, we're, we're getting close to uh, opening that back up to uh, allow people to upload. You can still download older data, but uploading new data. Um, so we have a, a little section on science and some, some of the education materials and uh, the section on the radio telescope. So there's where you, you can learn about Radio Jove and the equipment and you can download the manuals, the assembly manuals there. So all that is uh, freely available at our um, radiojove.gsfc.nasa uh, website. So uh, this is the, um, the, the legacy system now. It's uh, the Radio Joe, uh, well, since we're calling the new one 2.0, <laughs> we've started calling this one 1.0 or, or the original system. The uh, parts were just getting too onerous to, uh, to, to pain here. And so continuing to try to um, uh, supply those uh, receivers was was just becoming too too cumbersome. So we stopped um, uh, selling those in um, February of this year, and it's it's too bad. But uh, we really like that uh, that radio. You know, Dick Dick Flag designed that, and it it worked fantastic. Um, it was a lot of fun to build, and it uh, was a great. Um, kind of learning experience just to just to put it together, so we we sort of miss that aspect of uh, of Radio Joe, but we still support them, and we we have a lot of those kits out there, and uh, we we know many people are still using them, and so we we still interact with those those folks and answer questions and and uh, uh, you know try to encourage them to continue to participate with us. Um, so the dipole, single or dual dipole that you get with the, uh, the original kit, and unless, uh, uh, I'm not a very good photographer, but I know it's very, very difficult to take a, take a picture of a radio antenna and get it to show up. So I've, I've fudged it and put put a little lines on there so you can see the the, the dipole wires there. Um, <clears throat> give you an idea of the of the size of the um, these are half wave dipoles at, uh, at twenty megahertz, so you know seven and a half meters or so. Um, and so it's it's not terribly easy to uh, find that kind of space um, to to erect these kind of antennas, but uh, um, it's a very simple. Um, antenna, as you know, and uh, there's some data, uh, solar radio data from uh, one of our relatively new um, observers, John Cox in uh, South Carolina. So again, that um, that system we still support, although we we no longer no longer um, sell those. Um, Jim Sky, as you know, is still. Uh, uh, supporting the, the radio skypipe software and he he uh, for a long long time he's got the uh, free version and now he's converted it to uh, what he calls donationware so essentially it's a it's a fully capable version is free with um, um, you know a uh, a plea for a donation I guess uh, for uh, if you use that from his site, radiosky.com. So he's been a you know excellent supporter of Radio Jove and, and that software, as you many of you know, is 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 really, really good. So what is a Radio Jove 2.0? Well, it's essentially taking the step into uh, a spectrograph. So the hardware now, the 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 uh, SDR hardware that's that's come available, the commercial hardware that's available is so good and relatively inexpensive you know, we can we can do the same system that's about the same cost as the original radio joe so um, the um, using uh, these new hardware we still use the same same uh, dipole 
uh, dual dipole tele, uh, antenna, we're still observing Jupiter, the sun, the Milky Way background, and in even Earth-based uh, radio missions as part of uh, uh, 2.0. And again, we're, we're out there to help inspire people to get involved in science, and uh, in particular um, radio astronomy, and hopefully guide them, help them become what we call citizen scientists. So collaborating with um, um, doing, doing science yourself or collaborating with others to, to um, answer science questions or contrib contribute data that would, that would help um, uh, scientific research as, as an ultimate goal. And uh, of course, increasing science literacy, um, radio astronomy, is, as many people you know, said, said yesterday, is a, is, a, is a great learning tool, hands-on tool. Uh, it's a great way to learn some um, basic physics. And you know, we're trying to get, continue to build our network of uh, solar Jupiter observers to um, um, do more science, answer, answer some more questions and, you know, sharing data and um, archiving data. So it's easily accessible as part of our, our mission too. And so, you know, we're, we're interested in the general public and, and, you know, you guys are already well above the, the, the uh, technological curve of the general population. So uh, um, you would, you are the radio enthusiast that I'm, that I'm mentioning here, and you know any kind of clubs or you know high school groups, and, and we've got several colleges, universities that are that are doing some uh, some projects with us, and you know we're hoping to uh, uh, again to um, help people learn, improve, and also um, you know become contributors to. Uh, science, uh, science quality data. So here's the um, new system. So we, we still use the original di dual dipole. And <clears throat> again, I've, I've highlighted the, the wires uh, along there so you kind of see it. Um, 30 by 40 uh, feet is really what you need for the, for the um, both dipoles there. And the radio that we uh, centered on is the SDR Play model, we're using the RSP-1A, and uh, they're still available, and they're on uh, the newer, or sort of, I should say, the lower expensive models, and they work very, very well, and with uh, upgrades from Jim Sky, he's got now Radio Sky spectrograph software to, to display um, the, the data. So the, the, um, you know, as you, as you know, a, a single wire cut, cut for, in our case, cut to 20 megahertz is, uh, will resonate a couple of megahertz, uh, uh, either side of that. And you get some, obviously get some fall off, uh, as you, uh, get farther away from the center frequency there. But the, the RSP1A model um, has eight megahertz uh, bandwidth. So we, we go ahead and use all eight megahertz bandwidth. So we plot uh, with this uh, radio sky spectrograph software. Um, we center at 20 still. And so we're, we're, we're plotting from 16 to, to 24 megahertz. And, and the reason, even back to Radio Joe 1, was the, the reason is... Uh, that's a, uh, a, a good uh, uh, spot, uh, frequency region for Jovian radio emissions. So you, you've got to get above the ionosphere cutoff, you know, depending on the, the solar cycle and depending on your location, you know, typically above 15 megahertz. Um, and you can go down to 10 or eight or, you know, at times, but uh, reliably, you've got to get you've got to get above more or less 15 megahertz to uh, uh, otherwise those signals are absorbed by the ionosphere, and uh, and Jupiter has a cutoff, magnetic cutoff, 
at about 40 megahertz, 39 and a half megahertz. And that's, that's due to its uh, magnetic field. Now, once you get above 30 megahertz, uh, the likelihood of, of Jupiter emitting and, and us receiving those signals, you know, is very, very low. So somewhere in the um, 15 to 25 megahertz range is the best um, region for, for observing Jupiter. And so Dick Flagg uh, designed the, the original receiver at 20.1 megahertz for, with that in mind. And so Jupiter emits broadband across there and so does the sun. So it works for both. Um, why 20.1 is so we could dial down to the 20.0 on, uh, on the Radio Jove 1 receiver. We could dial down to 20.0 to pick up the WWV is a, is a great uh, tool for uh, testing your, your equipment. So, uh, so that's why we're, we're using this um, part of the spectrum. So we're 16 to 24 here, and uh, you can adjust the color, color scheme there to uh, you know, help you uh, pull out some of the, the, the signals and what, what you're seeing there are some uh, um, type three solar bursts. They're the vertical stuff and the horizontal stuff shows up. Uh, that's your interference typically, um, stations or uh, you know, local le electronics things. Hopefully they're narrow band and they don't bother you too much. And so the, the spectrograph is, not only does it give you a nicer color plot, you know, it's, it's a, a little more alluring to, uh, to the eye and to, to new observers. Um, the spectral data uh, obviously is just more scientifically useful. And uh, we can learn something about the source and about the, the, the mechanism by which the emission is happening by, by studying some of the, uh, the spectral signatures. And so, you know, and for the same cost, you, you get a, you get a, a better system. So that's all, all that was a driver for, uh, for Radio Jove 2.0. And we really started selling these uh, kits, um, I think in March uh, of this year. So we're, we're brand, or maybe it's February, I can't remember now, but um, we're, we're brand new into this. Um, and so far it's, uh, it's, it's going well. So, uh, you know, the nitty gritty of it here, here's the cost. And uh, so we're, we're selling in the, the kit. There's, there's nothing to build on the receiver anymore. So uh, that comes, uh, we include the cables, um, USB cables for you. And uh, if you want to build the dipoles yourself, um, that's $215. And of course, you'll need the um, PVC pipe or wood or what, whatever you're going to use to uh, erect your, your antennas. That, that those costs are extras, but all the plans are in the, the manuals that uh, uh, come with it. And then you can see what, what comes with the kit, you know, when you order it. So the only thing you need to buy is rope and stakes and uh, some hardware uh, for uh, uh, mounting the uh, uh, guy ropes or uh, uh, the, the, the PVC masts. <clears throat> Um, we also sell uh, the, the old kit, you know, part of, part of the uh, learning experience was uh, soldering the parts onto the board. And uh, a lot of the younger people have never done that. And so that was a, a, a great learning experience for people. And, and now, since we don't, we don't have that, uh, uh, you still have to solder. If you build your own antenna, you still have to solder um, the coax to the uh, to the wire to the copper wire, but uh, if you don't have a soldering iron or don't have uh, access to one, um, we off also offer offer the uh, antenna you know, pre sought pre soldered pre built for you, and uh, so that's that's three eighty four, and I should should mention obviously this requires a computer um, to uh, to connect this as well, so. Uh, 
that's uh, that's the cost and uh, what what you get with the kit um, right now. And one uh, one aspect, I'm going to stop sharing this and and go to this. Uh, I got it. One part of this. Um, let's see if I can copy and paste this, and I'll reshare my screen here. Larry Dodd down in uh, Jasper, Georgia, also North Georgia, um, has figured out a way to stream his data live via YouTube. So I'm going to see if I can reshare screen, sharing sound, and my web browser, so I hope you can see that. And let's see. It's all the way up. We see it and hear it. You can hear it. Okay, excellent. So um, we 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 love to uh, uh, highlight this to beginners as for two reasons. If you don't have the ability to purchase a, a, a telescope or you don't have the space, you can actually, you know, sort of participate. You can watch data live from, from Larry in, uh, in Georgia there. Um, and you can see his, his spectrograph. Again, 16 to 24 megahertz there. Um, you're seeing a sweeper there, um, radar sweeper there, the diagonal line there. Um, so that's a that's a, another telltale sign that you've got your <laughs> antenna and your equipment set up correctly. If you get those um, uh, those radar sweepers come through, and you know, depending on the time of day and what, what's going on, you're you're you'll get some um, lightning, as you can see those uh, real fine spiky looking things, vertical spikes, um, typically a signature of local lightning. Horizontal bands again are. Uh, uh, local interference or um, and then you've got those little dashed lines there so that's uh, uh, we think local electronics there um, turning on or off or so uh, uh, you can still do some uh, even in a medium noisy site with a spectrograph you can still um, pick up some Jupiter or pick up some solar radio bursts so it's you're not if you're only observing, you know, narrow band with Radio Joe one at near 20 megahertz, you, you might be out of luck. But here, you still have the op opportunity to uh, um, make some detection. So this is a, a, a really um, a great site to uh, show people um, what what the system is supposed to look like and what some of the sounds that you might get. It's not like buzz to me. Um, so I'll uh, stop sharing that and reshare my PowerPoint. And I might, uh, maybe I'll put this in the chat. Let's see. Can I do that? Can I walk and chew gum at the same time here? That's going to be interesting. Right, let's see if I can find the chat. There we go. So here's the... There's the link for Larry's YouTube uh, channel if you ever interested in uh, hey Chuck, we're still getting we're still getting the sound from the YouTube channel oh all right yeah thank you that's a uh, let me block that right now and pause that there we go um so hope hopefully you can hear me again better um you're good Thank you. Yeah. Let me go back to full screen mode. There we go. 
um, again, just a, it's a great, great tool for us to uh, show um, and highlight, you know, what, what, um, and uh, the other thing I wanted to mention about this is for beginners, we love to uh, point to this as a, as a, um, a way for people to confirm their own observations. You know, we have so many people who are uh, new to solar or Jupiter radio astronomy, and they don't know what, what it is they're, they're observing. And of course, you know, as you know, a great uh, way to uh, validate your, your um, signal is for an extraterrestrial signal is obviously that somebody else is picking up the same thing. Uh, if not, it's most likely local interference and especially Jupiter, those, uh, those signals can be uh, very tricky to, uh, to, to, to detect uh, sometimes, um, especially the weaker stuff and people can get fooled by um, even by, you know, local interference. Now, um, I wanted to show you uh, uh, just a, a live demo here that I have set up in my office. Um, and before I switch over to that, you can see what, what it, the, the connection stream looks like here. It's pretty, pretty straightforward. Your antenna and the, uh, the receiver and then the software. So it's, it's uh, very simple to, to connect. And so you've got to have, uh, um, we're still using the F type connector, F type connectors for our, um, our uh, antennas. So you've got to have a, um, well, a series of connections to get to the uh, SMA type connector in those uh, SDR plays, not real, Real happy with the uh, SMA connectors, but uh, um, they're they're a, a little fragile. So we like to have the the little six inch cable to take strain off of that uh, uh, that connector right into the box. So uh, that's what you see there, and then a, a USB to go into your computer. And <clears throat> Jim has uh, again written this spectrograph software to, to display the signal for us as a um, frequency time spect spectrograph. And that's typically what uh, you know, uh, we use um, to analyze the signals, display the signals and analyze them as opposed to the waterfall type. We wanna see the full, um, uh, a time, the full spectrum, you know, uh, and capture that um, as frequency time um, plots to uh, to analyze the those signals. There is an intermediary um, piece of software that uh, uh, Nathan Town wrote for us, um, uh, SDR Play to RSS. So. That is what actually controls the radio. And I'll stop sharing here and I'll, I'll uh, I've got to stop my PowerPoint here and go to my desktop and see if I can share that. Okay, hold on, I've got to, yeah, I'm gonna share that. And I'm gonna try to move you guys out of the way. There we go. So what I have here, boy, what happened? My radio is, uh, it's gotten a lot more noisy in here. I was going to unfurl my antenna here my dipole here in my office, um, see if I could get a better signal, but I didn't, didn't have a chance to do that. So we're getting a little bit uh, kind of overload on some of those uh, lower channels there, but this is uh, um, my radio connected to a 
single dipole that's actually rolled up in the corner of my office. So I don't even have it unfurled. And the, uh, you know, what, what you're seeing here is, is a lot of garbage um, from my building. We're, we happily got our building renovated uh, a few years ago, but in doing so, they installed a lot of uh, card key access and new fire suppression system. Um, of course, uh, you got fluorescent lights uh, throughout the building, and all, all these are, you know, known uh, RFI emitters. So, you know, you're not going to do too much radio astronomy in your office um, with your antenna in your office, as you can tell. Um, let's see, let me drop the gain down here a little bit. That's a little better. You can change the color gain on this software to kind of give you a little bit uh, less abrasive background, I guess. Um, but I, I just wanted to, to show you the, the SDR Play uh, radios come with their own, own software. It's, it's, it's quite good. And <clears throat> the SDR Play uh, folks at their website have, have some great videos and tutorials about how to use their SDR Uno software. And <clears throat> so that, that controls the, the, the radio and you can uh, use the SDRs for you know, multiple things. Um, lots and lots of uh, things. So, um, so we've obviously, you know, in, in doing Radio Jove, um, as you know, it's very ham friendly. You know, you, you've got a ham radios. You can you can do some some uh, radio astronomy as long as you uh, turn off that AGC and maybe point your antenna uh, at a little different different place so it's it's a uh, it's everything else is the same right uh, the electronics and and uh, the tools are, are very very similar um, but we don't use the SDR Uno software so we we're using this SDR play 2 RSS kind of in intermediary software and it's it now loads when when you load the radio sky spectrograph a more recent version of it, when you load that, it loads this SDR Play 2 RSS, and then you can actually go in, as you uh, see here, there's some of the controls here, you can change the reduction, the, the gain on there, the uh, bandwidth, center frequency, um, you know, offsets, gains. These, these radios are extremely sensitive, and so we've gone through a bunch of headaches to uh, try to optimize the settings for you um, to give you the best chance to observe, you know, Jupiter or solar. So when you download the software and install it, it'll have these settings um, already there, but you're free to make some adjustments if, you, if you'd like. So uh, that's the um, um, SDR Play 2 RSS software, and then the RSS software that you see here, again, is our rolling uh, frequency time spectrograph display. And Jim has, has done, you know, uh, an incredible amount of work, similar to Radio Skypipe. You can actually change your um, mode. So you can, like, like in Skypipe, you can actually go to a uh, client mode and observe in real time someone else that is streaming their data. Uh, so you would have to stream, you would have to be streaming in server mode. And so let me see if I can stop this local and change to a client mode and Let's see if I can connect up to uh, Jim Brown up in Pennsylvania streams pretty reliably. So if I can connect to him. So there you go. So one, one click. And now I'm observing Jim Brown's live spectral data 
from his SDR play, but he's now on a, on a, on a TFD antenna. So this is the square um, terminated full of dipole antenna, um, which allows you to run dual polarization. So this is the right-hand channel that we're, we're, we're observing now, but you can see it's that easy with running the software. And so, uh, uh, again, it's a great tool. This software is a great tool to confirm your own, uh, uh, compare and confirm your own observations of, of solar Jupiter or, or uh, any other strange signals you, you, you might be getting. So uh, it's, uh, it's, works, it works great. So let me, uh, let me pause for a second and ask you if you have any questions. Um, and uh, and I'll, I'll let me stop sharing here real quick and I'll pause and see if you have any questions about the software. Well, I've got a question about the antennas, Chuck. Uh, is there any advantage to uh, circular polarization? Yes, um, that's, a, that's a great question. Um, and I should have pointed that out earlier, but <clears throat> Jupiter emits <clears throat> circularly polarized. So it's a cyclotron process. And so you, you, if you have a circularly polarized antenna, um, you know, crossed Yagi or, or a helix type antenna, you're going to have better gain for, for those right hand or left hand circularly polarized signals. Now, of course, with a linear antenna, you're still going to pick them up, but you're going to be down um, half power uh, with, uh, with a linear antenna. So um, for us, for, for Jupiter um, radio emissions, we like to use square arrays. So we have two dipoles east-west and two dipoles north-south, and you bring them together in a hybrid ring, and you can get right hand and left hand circular out of it. So essentially you have a four dipole square and you can make a um, polarized set of antennas out of there. So that's, that's a little bit, you know, it's advanced and that's, that's, you know, as you know, the cool thing about radio astronomy, you can change one thing, your antenna or your receiver or your bandwidth or something, and you, you're learning new things. So, uh, so uh, uh, the polarized um, data are uh, uh, is, is another step up, I guess, scientifically. Well, with, with that scheme, do you use two SDRs, two channels? Yes, yes, that's a good point. You, you would need two radios to do that. Or they don't sell them anymore, but the, the um, SDR2 um, was a dual channel. So we could actually get both channels in one radio. Um, on the old STR um, two Pro, I think it was called. So that's right. You would need you need two uh, two radios. Are, are the emissions predominantly right or left-handed polarized? For Jupiter, um, they're both, but uh, you you can predict. So the right-hand stuff typically comes from the northern hemisphere uh, of Jupiter, and then the left hands uh, from the southern, and um, and so using Radio Jupiter um, Pro software, you can actually predict when those IO related storms are gonna happen. And it, it, you know which ones are right hand and which ones are left hand. So you could uh, easily swap your um, antenna to, if you only had one radio, so to say you could, you could listen to it on the right hand circular um, output or or switch it and and, and listen to the left hand, um, but uh, for the northern hemisphere, Earth northern hemisphere observers, you're better off with a right hand um, polarized antenna. You, you're going to pick up more more Jupiter uh, on the right hand channel essentially. So the software does support the uh, duo, the RSP. The duos, yes, um, not quite, Charles. I, I wish the um, the the problem is the SDR play to RSS, that intermediary piece of software. The the duos are 
it's the I think it's the um, is it the ASP in the, the, the whatever the the framework SDR Play changed the framework of their software, and so we can't use the um, our current software on the Duo. There is an an option. There is something um, I, sh I should have had a slide prepared for it, but uh, there's something called SDR console. And you can run any SDR using SDR uh, console to uh, connect, uh, um, well, I shouldn't say any, but many different types of SDR. So you don't, you're not limited to the SDR play. We are using the SDR play as sort of the introductory um, level um, kit based, you know, hopefully you, you put it together and everything works. You don't have to tweak too many things to, uh, to be successful. But if you have a different SDR, you can use this um, SDR console. And if at the end of my talk here, I'll, I'll put a link up to, to where you can get access to that. It's free. Uh, Larry Dodd in, in Jasper, Georgia there, he's, he's uh, quite the expert on that, that software. And he's got many different receivers um, working, uh, many different SDRs working with, uh, with the uh, Radio Sky Spectrograph software. So you do have an option, but unfortunately the Duo is not, not with the, uh, the, uh, the sort of the standard software that we offer. Okay, not the uh, Duo, but perhaps the SDR Play 2. What happens with software? Right. So the two and the the um, the one, the one A and the two are the old architecture that works with our current system. But the one and the two are no longer for sale, and only the one A they're still SDR still selling. Um, but if you have a one or a two, they would work. But the duo and, and two has two inputs, uh, yeah. lots of dipoles. Uh, what does the software do then? So you can you can display both channels. The RSS the Spectrograph software allows you to display both the both channels, right hand, left hand, in our case. And so you don't choose; they're just both up. Wow. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. No, it's it's, it's fantastic if you can get if you can get both channels. Um, and you either have two two receivers, or you have uh, um, the the SDR Play Two. It'll uh, the software will display both both channels simultaneously on, on screen. So with two channels now, what are you seeing? Are they bopping together to the same rhythm, or are they entirely different, independent because they're north and south poles? No, they're um, well. Uh, they're mostly observing, you know, they're very similar in their, in their output. But when you're observing Jupiter, absolutely. When you're observing a, um, what we call the IOA or IOB with the Northern Hemisphere, right-hand circularly dominated radio emission, your right-hand channel will um, show the, the, the signals. The left-hand channel there's some bleed over, um, but uh, the left-hand channel will not show those right-hand polar, right-hand circularly polarized data, and then and vice versa. You, when you have a left-hand storm, uh, uh, Jupiter event, the left-hand channel will will uh, show the signals where the right-hand channel will not. But because we're we're using two linear uh, antennas and then a hybrid ring, you're still gonna get some emission from the other two um, dipoles, so to speak. So, so there is some, some mixing that goes on there, but, but, but the right-hand channel will, will dominate for the right-hand emissions, left-hand channel will um, display the, the left-hand dominant signals simultaneously. I'm not sure about the uh, RTL ring. or SDR. Bruce, the, RT, the RTL bridge? 
I'm talking about uh, how about uh, RTL uh, SDRs that everybody has around? Use that with a yeah you know, one of the up converters. You have something. I think it's a, a eight bit versus twelve bit conversion. Is that enough for the job? And is that uh, a way with that uh, SDR console to uh, keep care of actually running it into uh, uh, Jim Sky's uh, spectrograph? Yeah, I think some some the, we've tried the 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 RTL and the the software. Uh, Skypipe software does have um, um, what does he call it? Um, it's, it's essentially an add-on to, to to the software, an RTL bridge, he calls it. So, I th I think you can get it to work. The problem we have with those radios is the the overload and the the, the um, trying to get the um, um, the gain settings correct and the um, attenuation correct. It, 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 we've we've not had very good luck with observing Jupiter uh, with those things. So uh, um, I would love we would have loved to have those work because those are much much cheaper and uh, more ubiquitous. But uh, they uh, the um, the ability to change the the, uh, the to, to, to to tweak the filtering and the, the, the gains and and the and the attenuation on those things just doesn't work. It's it's uh, you, you need a little bit nicer radio uh, effectively. I thought their minimum frequency was about thirty megahertz, and you're trying to get down to twenty. But uh, are, do you just use it above 30, 30 to forty? You say. Well, you, yeah, you could, and and that would be fine for uh, for solar radio emissions, and and some Jupiter, but but again, with the uh, uh, the filtering on those, you you just we haven't had a whole lot of luck with them. Yeah, no. I was talking about the... using it with a uh, up converter uh, in order to get the uh, frequency there. I've also got around one of the uh, uh, Air Spy Minis, which is. Uh, uh, generally seems to perform quite a bit better than the RTL SDR type of thing. I'm wondering what the possibilities are with uh, yeah, that one. Yes, we've had luck with the Air Spies and I'm, I'm not sure which um, uh, model of the Air Spy, I'm gonna disconnect from, um, I'm trying to think of what, uh, I'm looking at Larry's, in, uh, in looking at the documentation here, it says uh, the RTL bridge, TCP, is how you access the air spy. It's what the, it's at least what the, the help says on the spectrum. Oh, it does. Graph. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. That's no, what we've had, yeah, we've had some luck with the air spies. The, uh, um, oh, I'm trying to think of some of the other uh, names. Uh, is it Equus? Is that... Uh, um, a brand of SDR, maybe Etus, E T T U. Yeah, thank you, thank you, e Etus. We've Etus. had some success with with the the Etus brands. Um, so the sky's the limit, really, with uh, with with different models, <clears throat> but but you're sort of <laughs> on your own in terms of uh, trying to get those to work. But the the SDR console would be the way to go to uh, uh, connect those up with. Uh, the Radio Sky Spectrograph software. Which uh, piece of software will build the data and structure it in the way that you want it to be uploaded to your system? And, and do you have that documented someplace? This Radio Sky Spectrograph, yeah, that, those, those files, the output files that get recorded are, we actually convert those. So Jim um, has, uh, it's, it's, I guess, proprietary, but it's, it's, it's not a secret. Um, he's got um, the uh, output as a, as a .sps um, file, and he's got all that on his uh, very, very well-documented help, help website there. So you can see the data, the data structure there, but we convert those to, for, for um, the, scientific archives, we have to convert those to um, 
Um, Bits files. Yes, I'm, I'm trying to um, think of the name of the, uh, the, the files that we use before we upload them to, uh, to our, uh, you know, our scientific uh, uh, archive. But uh, uh, I'm blanking on the name of it, but essentially it's, it's, it's a standard. It's a, a scientific standard um, with, with metadata and uh, uh, the, the appropriate uh, header information is, is in that, um, that file. To uh, and Jim Jim can convert his files to the to the standard files for for archiving. But if you've recorded data in in the Radio Sky Spectrograph software, that is what we want. Well, I have another question. Then. Uh, we were talking uh, okay. about RSP two uh, or the the play two. Uh, it has two inputs, so I'd have a set of dipoles into one and a set of dipoles into the other, yet you spoke about a hybrid ring, which is new to me. Okay, so yes, you, you've got two linear antennas, um, and, and, and I'll just say east-west and then two that are, that are north-south. Now, you've got you've to mix those, um, those, essentially those four antennas, and you you mix them with the hybrid ring. You can build your own. Out but of but I see two inputs coming into the receiver, so I see two coax. Right. You've got four four antenna four antennas, which will get mixed and converted into uh, right hand circular and left hand circular outputs from the hybrid ring. So I see an analog four, conversion. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Four into two. And then those two will, will come into the radio and you get right hand and left hand. And is there a document somewhere that describes how to build your ring if you want to build one of these? Yes, I believe there is somewhere. I'd have to uh, to find it for you, but it's, it should be on our Radio Joe site somewhere. And if it's not, you know, we can we can put it there. But yeah, you can you can build your own out of uh, varying lengths of coax and it's or just a phase, phasing line, I think, is what yeah. you're building. Yeah. Yeah. It's a 90 degree hybrid, essentially. Right. And, uh, or you can buy one off the shelf. That'll do it for you. They're 60 bucks, I think. Uh, um, they're not terribly cheap, but uh, if you don't, don't want to build one, you, you have that option. One, one more question about the software, though. I'm still confused. On the upload to you, is that automated, or, or do you, you have to manually push your files up occasionally? Right now, um, you have to manually do it. Way back when, we did have an automatic upload with a single frequency. But <clears throat> so this a 24-hour plot of Radio Jove 1 was 12 megabytes you know, essentially a very narrow band. Um, and 24 hours of the SDR, you don't have to record 24 hours, but uh, is um, 600 and something megabytes. And so uh, uploading, moving, downloading those files, uh, it gets onerous. So we actually have a, a, a limit, a file limit. So, um, to, to or we're going to instill a, a file size limit of about 32 megabytes. So you bet about an hour uh, of data. So if you observe some solar emissions or some Jupiter emissions, you can uh, cut cut your file down to this just that one hour. And Jim Jim has tools in the software to do that very easily. And uh, you save that smaller file, and you have you have to manually upload it right now. We're, um, we, we're, we're hoping in the future that it would be more automated, you know, and what we're trying to do is, you know, establish um, a, a way for, so you, you, you have to sign up um, and get a password to upload your data. I mean, that's just uh, for us to, to try to weed out the garbage 
um, from anyone, you know, just uploading whatever they want to. Um, but what, what we're trying to do is, you know, any radio joke person can upload to, to the archive. And we, we've had that um, since we started the archive and we want to continue that. But we're, we're going to try to um, um, uh, create, I guess, uh, a tier of, of data in terms of the science quality. So once you've reached a level of science quality, I mean, is, is it calibrated? Is it, you know, all, all the timing accurate? All, all these things. Then those are the data that, that we'll, we'll use for, for scientific purposes. That, that's our science quality data. So um, we want people to be able to upload freely, um, to exchange data, to, to upload interference, uh, to, to show us examples of different kinds of interference or uh, what, whatever, um, as part of the you know education aspect of it. To, so that's 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 good, um, but we we're we're hoping that uh, um, those who want to take the the extra step of, of creating scientific quality data will. Well, essentially what we're gonna do is create a special place for, for those data and keep those long-term for, for science analysis. Hey, Chuck, uh, two quick questions. Uh, um, I've had a Radio Joe for about three years and uh, I bought one of these little calibration boxes. And um, does that still work on the spectrograph? And my second question is <clears throat> from a, <clears throat> excuse me, a scientific analysis point of view, the citizen science, um, what is like a day in <clears throat> a day in the life of pulling the archives up of all this data you've collected and analyzing it and co coming up with, you know, what am I seeing in, at Jupiter and uh, the Sun? Yeah, yeah, a, a great question. So the uh, the, the original calibrators, um, the RF twenty eighty flag calibrators, work only with the Radio Jov one. Uh, kits. So, um, the you know the problem with multi-frequency observations is to try to get a calibrator that will uh, go across equally across the full band. You've got to have a multi-frequency calibrator, and we want multi-step. And so we developed one. So, uh, but they're five hundred dollars. And that was for sort of our top level citizen science people um, who uh, uh, are contributing data like that. So um, Jim Sky has been uh, tinkering and we think with the SDR um, play, the receiver itself and with, with a little, uh, uh, inexpensive board, we can get a, a calibrator and, and, a, and, a, and a noise source. We can get a, a multi-step calibrator um, in the near, in the future. I don't know about near future, but our goal is to get an inexpensive calibrator so we can get more people on board so uh, to, to calibrate their data. So that's, uh, that's a little bit uh, uh, the way is off uh, right now, but that's high on our to-do list is to get that get that working. Now we do have a um, a calibrator that we will loan people, so that's that's an option. We have a loaner um, calibrator that we can send if if uh, folks wanted to calibrate their their uh, uh, spectrograph. Now in terms of the day in the life, so so for those folks doing citizen science, they're collecting data and, and storing it themselves 24 seven typically. Um, now uh, we have, let me um, go back to my uh, PowerPoint here and I'll, I'll kind of skip ahead to, to help answer your question, Rich. Um, and share screen here. Okay, and I'm gonna move that out of the way and plop that back. 
Oh, okay. And uh, let's see, I'm gonna go come back to that. So here's some of the, the, the advanced hardware you see here. So we have an automatic multi-step calibrator. We have wide band antennas. Uh, this, in this case, a terminated folded dipole. It's a square array. So you get right hand, left hand, uh, wide band. And then through the spectrograph software, you can create a calibration curve. So uh, you connect to the calibrator and the software controls it and steps through um, uh, a whole set, a series of, uh, of uh, antenna, known antenna temperatures and then creates this cal curve. And then on the fly, then your spectrograph then you can use your cursor and move it on your spectrograph and it'll tell you what the antenna temperature is at any frequency at any time. So it's really slick, but you're getting, uh, you know, you're getting expensive there and you're, you're into um, Wolfgang. I, I thought that was Wolfgang's uh, uh, statement yesterday about professional amateurism or something like that. I think he, he mentioned, I thought that was a great, uh, a great term is that, you know, we're, we're, we're getting, you know, for us, it's just more science quality um, data and uh, more professional, professional results here. Um, but that, you know, that comes at a cost. And uh, uh, as I said, we're trying to get a, uh, um, uh, a less expensive uh, calibrator out um, here uh, so you can you can take that next step in terms of professional um, professional observations. Um, so there's the data archive. Um, so we have a way to uh, the upload capability is not public yet. We we've got it working uh, kind of in house right now, but uh, we're going to release that uh, very very soon, and. Even our professional data will go to the planetary data system. Some of our some of our top top data um, they are archiving it down out at UCLA. So that's uh, that's kind of cool. Uh, I'll come back to this. Um, where am I uh, going, Rich? I've lost my train of thought here. I wanted to uh, day, day in the life of a citizen scientist. Yeah, yeah. So. People uh, record their their data, um, and we have. Uh, I know where I was going. Um, we have a, uh, a groups.io uh, listserv now that, that uh, one can join, and we share screenshots uh, essentially of of radio data uh, all the time. You know, people sharing Jupiter or or solar radio emissions, and. When there's something interesting, we'll uh, we'll ask the person to upload it to you know a Dropbox or something so we can get the full full data set, and then we, meaning me or or some of the other scientists, will use those for um, uh, analyzing the data more carefully or comparing it with uh, different sites. And I, I wanted to point this. Uh, this out to you. This is cool. This is Tom Ashcraft's um, actually pointed these things out to us in his spectral data. So these ionospheric lightning echoes, these um, uh, triagonal, triagonal looking um, enhancements on the spectrograph are um, uh, a consequence of distant lightning. So we've got a thunderstorm. And so, so now we're, it's just terrestrial, terrestrial uh, uh, sort of interference here, but, but they show these in, in, incredible um, um, spectral signatures. And that caught um, a colleague of mine up at uh, NASA Goddard, um, Xing Feng, and he's a heliophysicist and uh, studies Earth's ionosphere as well. So we're, he wrote a paper based on these observations in the geophysical research letters, that was 2020. And uh, so <clears throat> the data that people share or collect could, 
you know, lead to this, this kind of uh, publication. So um, the, the day in the life is you're, you're collecting data, you know, typically 24 seven, but uh, um, you, you certainly don't have to. The software allows you to start and stop if you wanted just to collect solar emissions or, or, uh, or observe only when Jupiter, you know, is in, in, in your sky. So, uh, um, and if there's something of interest, then we, we reach out to you um, and ask you for your data that we'll use. Um, and we've had uh, Dave Topinski down in Florida give, give a talk at a science conference on his Jovian um, radio emissions that he's collected over, over the years. So um, um, there's a lot of work on the front end getting your system kind of up to scientific standards, if you will. But after that, you're just collecting data and then, and then it's up to you whether you want to contribute to the publication or help write the paper or, or uh, just be a part of the publication with your data. So you, you kind of have a choice of how, how engaged you want to be there. So uh, um, it's, uh, you know, we, we got a, a whole range of, of levels of, of interaction that, uh, that people could, could get involved in. in and, and that's sort of what we're trying to fine tune a little bit um, going forward with the citizen science to try to encourage people to um, become citizen scientists. And, you know, uh, Steve, you know, mentioned all these great online courses that you can take and, and, and certificates you can get. And, and many of you are already have this knowledge. And so just being, being part of it or contributing data um, it should be a, a, a far reach for, for many of you because of your, your expertise. So I hope that sort of answers your question there. Um, uh, it is great. But it's, you know, citizen scientists is kind of a new thing in the last, uh, oh, five to, five to 10 years. And we're all sort of stumbling over this. And, you know, people who go out and observe uh, butterflies in their garden and take pictures and upload pictures of butterflies in their garden to uh, iNaturalist uh, uh, site is considered citizen scientists because they're they're doing butterfly counts. Or you take a walk in the woods and you're taking pictures of different pine cones or something. Those are valuable data. You know, it's uh, uh, you know this the Galaxy Zoo um, identifying uh, 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 galaxies, um, classifying them. That's that's really what took it to the, the, the next level um, in terms of citizen science. So, um, uh, you know, doing uh, um, this, uh, you know, collective, collaborative um, uh, research uh, in, in different areas is, is really been uh, uh, changing rapidly in terms of the involvement and, and the capabilities, you know, you can do a lot of science with, with your, your smartphones now and contributing, you know, data, light pollution data uh, or audio data to uh, see what kind of, uh, uh, you know, background noise you have at your uh, audio background noise you have at your home to look at uh, um, bird, migration patterns and you know all kinds of cool stuff that there's that they're out there but you know we're all, all obviously focused in on uh, um, radio astronomy and and there's you know several different uh, angles to, to do that um, so uh, so there's the archive uh, see did I skip over nope oh here's just some example observations that I skipped over there's the uh, the lightning signature there in the upper right, some um, solar bursts, uh, and there's some Jovian bursts there. You can see some Faraday uh, rotations, um, or Faraday lanes. They're the sort of the sloping diagonal type lanes. So that is a consequence of right-hand circular or left-hand circular polarization uh, propagating through the ionosphere at different, uh, at different rates. So you can actually see that, that signature in, um, 
in those Jovian signals there, and you get to some solar burst there and the, the, the local or distant radar sweepers. Um, and I'm part of a, um, a group uh, out of NASA Goddard. Actually, it's NASA headquarters, but it's the Heliophysics Education Activation Team, HEAT. And it's an education group trying to uh, help people, get, uh, educate people on solar science. And uh, so we all know about these radio fade outs um, with SIDS. You know, we can see these in the spectral um, signatures uh, as well. When you get a, a large solar flare that affects your... Uh, affects the local ionosphere, and then your um, background changes. You get, a, you get a fade out, and those show up very, very well uh, on, on the spectral uh, uh, data output. Um, two others uh, that we're working on, of course, we've been uh, observing Jupiter for a long, long time, and we have these um, maps of the uh, IO phase, the orbital position of IO versus Jovian longitude. So we, we map where the emission is, is coming from, where, where IO is related. So we have the, our standard A, B, C, and D radio sources, but we can build up um, uh, these radio maps going forward. And something that uh, has only been done recently is building these maps splitting it into two maps, a right-hand circular polarized map and a left-hand. So uh, that's uh, something that uh, Radio Jove people could, could contribute to kind of going forward. And something that, uh, two other things, a, a quiet day curve. So that establishes uh, what your local quiet uh, conditions are every day for an entire year. So what is your, um, background, galactic background level, and we can compare that, and we know there's a latitudinal effect, uh, ionospheric latitudinal effect, and so if we have enough data points from equator to pole, we can study the ionosphere um, from observing the Milky Way galactic background um, at these frequencies, 16 to 24 megahertz. And something I've been kind of doing for fun is just counting, I've had students do this over the years, just counting solar radio bursts. And this is going back using the old Radio Jove 1 data, just going through and counting the number of solar uh, spikes that we get um, in, in the data and plotting it, you know, with uh, uh, against the sunspot number. And I, I'd like to, to continue, to, I don't know what the science is in that, um, uh, to be perfectly honest, um, what we're going to learn scientifically, but um, it's a, it's a, uh, I want to put this on the website and, and uh, make this sort of active where every month we, we take a monthly average uh, and plot it here and we, we plot that uh, going forward and we can, we can fill in the 10, 10.7 solar radio flux and, and, and sunspot number and see if there might be something we can learn um, from these low frequency uh, radio bursts. And uh, so I've talked about this, and let me just summarize here uh, that uh, you know Radio Jove 2.0 is 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 now out there, and we're we're uh, selling kits, uh, distributing kits, and I I, I can't thank um, Sarah enough for their uh, grant program. That's that's really really a, a great program, and I, I know you've highlighted the problem with trying to get some feedback from from grantees. And as you mentioned, we have sort of the same issue with, with Radio Joe of trying to get, get people. And, you know, it, it takes just hounding them really is the, is, is the only way to do it as far as I know. And, you know, that takes time and effort and, and, and people to do that. And that's, that's something we're lacking uh, as well. But uh, um, if you have any ideas about how to get people to respond back and, and give you a write-up, of, of their experiences, you know, I would, I would love to hear that. Um, so we're uh, in the process of developing some, some training tools, modules to help um, people learn about Radio Joe, say how to set up their equipment or how to build a polarimeter antenna or how to upload their data. 
how to calibrate their data. We're going to have lots of these things um, uh, populate our website going forward, and, and we'll, we'll certainly keep you abreast of that. And again, that's just to help train people to become um, better uh, at what they do, and then hopefully become uh, science quality, contribute science quality data. And so uh, um, Data Archive is, is going to open here very, very soon. And um, we've got our, our own listserv. And, uh, you know, we're gearing up to, to try to get enough people to observe um, the solar eclipses. Uh, the, the annular, I don't think we'll really learn too much, but uh, the, uh, the, the total solar eclipse in 24, we're hoping if we have enough data gathered within the path of totality and without, we might see um, some changes in the ionosphere due to the lunar shadow, uh, you know, ch changing the ionospheric um, um, density. And uh, so uh, we're always, always willing to uh, help amateurs um, become citizen scientists, and you know that's our that's our goal. And again, a big big thank you to Sarah. We've we've had some excellent collaborations over the years, and we hope that continues. And thank you again for your 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 time and and having me on this meeting and your excellent questions so far. And I'll I'll take more. Yeah, Chuck. Uh, just a, a quick reminder: you were going to put that uh, link on the chat for the SDR console software. Yes, yes. So let me stop, Jerry. I'm going to go find that, and uh, I'll get that out there to you. Thanks okay. for that reminder. Thank yeah, thank you. Uh, Jupiter was behind the sun for a while. Now it's not. So there are seasons to Jupiter watching? There is. And we, um, <clears throat> we typically observe Jupiter at uh, when it's up at night. I mean, that's the best chance you have to to actually pick up the Jovian signals. But now with these uh, um, spectrographs and, and you can distinguish the solar signals so much better in the spectral data uh, and the, the Jovian signals, we're picking up Jupiter darn near... Uh, uh, a few weeks after conjunction, you know, when Jupiter is directly behind the sun. And so n now the season, the Jupiter season, we used to, you know, call about eight months is really 11 and a half months. So you can, you can pick up Jupiter. Um, now it, it's, more highly unlikely that you're going to pick up a, a, a Jovian signal during the day when Jupiter is farther away. You have the inverse square effect going there too, but plus the ionosphere daily, uh, uh, the daytime ionosphere is more absorptive. So you're going to, you're going to have a tougher time picking up a Jovian signal, but people have done it. So uh, there are seasons of higher probability but those are um, so in the old days you liked Jupiter in the dark time mostly because that means the sun is uh, not in the uh, not in the way so we're closer to Jupiter mostly just closer we're closer to Jupiter and the ionosphere is less absorptive right it opens up at nighttime and right. so and, and now that too uh, which is yeah. yeah okay fascinating yeah yeah it's uh, much it's, more to explore it's much more to explore, yep. All right, um, I'm gonna go and uh, um, call it. Uh, you've, you've now caught up the schedule. So Chuck, thank you very much for- uh, um, Okay, I was long-winded, sorry about that. No, excellent, excellent work. Uh, first time we've heard from you uh, from uh, the Jupiter guys uh, on these conferences uh, for a long time and uh, um, it's a, I think you've just uh, opened up a whole new uh, field for these guys. Okay.